Welcome to Let's Talk a Little Shop, a podcast created by ASD Market Week. Let's Talk a Little Shop aims to help small businesses navigate the rapidly changing retail landscape. Whether you own a brick and mortar store, are an online seller, or both, this podcast provides tangible strategies to keep your cash register ringing. It's Michaela, and I am back with Deanna. And this week, we are going to talk about merchandising. So, Deanna, why don't you start by introducing yourself to our guests? Hi, everyone. I'm Deanna McIntosh. I'm the retail growth strategist at my company, Retailing Evolved. And I truly am so passionate about this industry and preaching about merchandising, (laughs) which seems like it's a like a lost art form because nobody's talking about it anymore. Um, but we're going to talk about it today. Um, but I have a background in corporate retail as a buyer, strategy manager, art director, what else? Merchandising director, logistics analyst. So I've seen the industry from a lot of different perspectives, but I'm really just passionate about driving the growth of small and mid-sized retail businesses so you can grow to big businesses. Awesome. So, Deanna, let's jump right into it. What are some of the biggest challenges you're seeing retailers face today? Yes. Supply chain, no brainer, right? I mean, how many days do we go without hearing about that? <laughs> it's, it's a huge issue, um, which obviously impacts the cash flow, which impacts your inventory, which impacts your customer satisfaction. So supply chain is a major issue right now. Um, And it looks like it's going to continue to be that way, unfortunately, throughout the rest of this year. And then also staffing. We've heard a lot about that across the board, across all industries. That's really an issue, especially for people with brick and mortar stores right now. And what have been some of the challenges you've heard when it comes to selling online or e-commerce? Yes, e-commerce is um, one of my favorite topics. But um, <laughs> but from a different perspective, I really look at e-commerce as another sales channel, whereas a lot of people, a lot of ind- like industry news um, publications, you just see like e-commerce is the bread and butter, e-commerce is the end all be all. But I don't see it that way. I see it as just another channel to reach your customer. And so with that, e-commerce has its challenges that for some reason, again, (laughs) a lot of people don't like to talk about. But one of the biggest ones is that low conversion rate. So last time I checked, it is on average about 3%. So meaning if 100 people come to your site, only three people buy. That is critically important to know what your conversion rate is um, on your store because A lot of small businesses that I see, their conversion rate is about 1.5% when we first start working together. So imagine how much marketing they have to pummel just to get these people to their site to only have, you know, a couple of people buy. So that's a huge issue, which leads to that marketing issue, which is the high customer acquisition cost. It goes hand in hand. And so the amount of marketing dollars that you're putting in, the amount of time you're spending on content and you're on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all the things, (laughs) trying to get these people to your site just to get those few people converting. And so there's just so many moving pieces in a retail business that I, especially with merchandising, that we do not talk about enough. But merchandising is the glue that makes sure that all these different pieces that are moving in your business are working together to your sales plan. (laughs) <laughs> and so, you know, you've you've talked a lot, you've touched a lot about marketing the products that you sell. But yeah. um, often in our conversation, you've often said to me, "Well, the problem isn't your marketing; it's your merchandising." So, yeah. let's can you kind of talk to the audience more about that in terms of the brick and mortar store, but also online? Mm-hmm. Merchandising is a term that, again, I think is just this like I don't even know what the word is it, but it's just like this floaty, cloudy word that just is beautiful, but nobody really knows what it means. <laughs> like A lot of people think that it means visual merchandising, and that's one component of it. But truly merchandising is the definition of it is getting the right products, which is your most important thing, the right products to the right people, you know, in the right places at the right price. And I add in the right quantities 
with the right promotion. <laughs> so merchandising is so many things, but I think the simplest way to explain it is merchandising is the operational system for the back office part of your business. So marketing, and here's another quote that I love. So marketing moves people towards goods. Merchandising moves goods towards the people. So like, and I'm probably doing this wrong, but like people to goods, goods to people. And so they're both working to get the goods where they need to go. But merchandising is product facing. It's all about your pricing, your customers. So getting your products to your people, right? Marketing is just, so it, it's they work hand in hand, but merchandising is everything that happens before you market your product. <laughs> so meaning um, in corporate, I love to explain this because people don't see this side of retail, really, unless you've been in the corporate sector. But merchandising is the glue. The buyers are the merchants. They're the glue. So everything starts and ends with them. So it starts with your financial plan, having one. <laughs> we got to all start there, right? So how much in sales do you want to do this year? And then from there, we work with the inventory planning team to say, okay, awesome. If my goal is 10 million this year, what does that actually look like? What does that look like by department? So tops, bottoms, pants, and so forth. And then how many SKUs does that mean? You know, if I have a sales plan for uh, 50,000 for tops, how many actual SKUs do I need to bring in to hit that goal? And then from there, you're sourcing, or if you make your own products, you're working with your design team, development team, to fill those gaps, fill those holes. If you have 50 SKUs, you source them or you create them. From there, you're working with production. All right, how much are we going to price these products? What are they going to cost? Which factories are we sending these to? You know, negotiating all those details. And then from there, <laughs> the next step is um, visual merchandising. So now you're like, okay, I have this physical product sample. Where am I going to place it in my brick and mortar store? or on my website. So remember, this is the first time that I'm separating those two. Merchandising is for both brick and mortar and e-commerce. It's just what you do with it, the output is a little different. So then you're like, okay, where am I placing the products? And then marketing comes into play. How are we going to promote the products? So you've just done all these other functions, the planning, the strategy, the pricing, the con, like everything. And now you're talking about marketing. That's the part that's always missing. Because um, typically I see people buying the products and then you go straight to market, but you're not thinking about all these other aspects that go into it. And so that's where merchandising comes into play. It's truly like creating this little, you're at the middle of the wheel and then you're working with all these functions in your business to make sure that they all work together. So every day you have a plan, your content is connected to something um, because of that plan. So hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> long winded but, uh, explanation. <laughs> no, it, it really does. So can yeah. you delve deeper into how um, retailers can kind of take some of that methodology and build better merchandising plans around yeah. what they're buying at the markets that they attend? Because, you know, there's hundreds yeah. or thousands of vendors with products across the board. So how would they how do they do that when they're in real time at market? Um, and let's say they've done the planning in terms of, okay, this is my financial goal. This is the number of SKUs I need. So how do they then take that planning and overlay that in that, that physical environment setting in order mm -hmm. to accomplish that? Yes. Great question. Well, one, well, I gotta, I do not want to forget this tool. It's called the Faves app. Um, look that up because that will help you when you're there. It helps you to like you can scan products and take pictures of them and load it into the app so you can organize everything and keep track to your budget. Super important. So but yeah, so showing up with a plan, knowing how many SKUs you need, but also not even just like I need 50 tops. But if you can get to this level of detail, try, but know like I need four white tops or four white long sleeve tops. If you can get down to that level of detail, which we do incorporate, <laughs> that is like a precise science. That's the science part of merchandising, but that'll at least help guide you more, right? So you're not just like, you don't end up with 10 white tops 
<laughs> like, you know, so just go with a, a bit more granular focus on what you're doing. But when you have that plan, if you know that in October, the message is cozy sweaters, you know that you're buying sweaters for this specific campaign, it helps your focus more. I hope that makes sense. So really just knowing what the trends are, which trends you want to stand for, which feeds into this plan that you have, which feeds into you going to market with a like pristine focus <laughs> on what you're doing. And where do you usually advise retailers to find trends if they can't subscribe to the very pricey but awesome trend services? That That's a yes. big thing. So it where is. do you look and where do you advise your clients to look? Mm -hmm. My favorite website for trends is trendhunter.com. It shows you trends from all industries all over the world. The coolest, craziest things. Um, one of my biggest tips is to do not think of yourself as a retailer. Think of yourself first as a business that serves your customer and solves a specific problem. And if you don't know what problem that is, find it. <laughs> like Create a problem that your store is solving. That's how you never go out of business. But yeah, when you stop and you're like, remove yourself from, I just sell products, you should do more. You should also sell services. You should think of how can I serve my customer at a deeper level? Um, that's how you start thinking more innovatively. So then when you go to Trend Hunter and you see that somebody in Japan has a, uh, some kind of crazy litter box I saw. It was like a spaceship litter box. I don't know. You know, you see that and you might be inspired by a piece of that that would connect to your business that has nothing to do with the pet business. But it's just like, don't box yourself in to this retail box, <laughs> if that makes and sense. You're, you're talking about like um, individuation in in, yeah. your, in your merchandising. So yes. I think you, let's, there's two things in there. So first, can you provide some examples of how you are, how someone could frame solving um, a problem and providing solutions through their merchandise to the audience? Yes, let's see, I had, and actually, this is a good example of somebody who was getting ready to start a store, thinking that she wanted to, she, self-care was important for her. And so she wanted to open up a store with self-care items. And so I was like, okay, well, we start talking more and more and more. And then like, well, what kind of products do you want to sell? What kind of, who's your customer? Like, what are you doing? So as we kept talking, I heard from her and I was like, in my head, I'm like, she doesn't really want to be a retailer. She just wants to help people with their self-care routine. So then we started talking about that. And so her concept and mindset changed from being a self-care store to instead helping people create their own routines for self-care every single day. So in that respect, to me and to her now, she's a service provider first and a retailer second. So she's actually selling routines for, for um, self-care that just happen to have products built into that routine. <laughs> and that, that is ridiculously smart. And it yes. ties right into the second part of the question. I'm going to ask you where it's, how do you use your merchandising to stand out from other competitors, whether there's one or there's a hundred that may have that same product? Um, right. And then, or do you, you, do you, so how do you do that? And then how do you maybe start to look for other products that aren't as readily available to tie mm -hmm. into helping with that as well? Yes. So how do you use merchandising to compete with people selling similar products? Yes. So that my answer to that is to, again, look at yourself as what problem are you solving? Because a, a lot, a good chunk of businesses start by just selling products honestly, um, and think that's okay. And for some people it is, <laughs> it might be. But for me, I think retail, at least the future, the evolution of it is more lifestyle driven, community driven. People want to be connected to the retailer. And there's a lot less people who have a connection, a true deep connection with their customers than you think. <laughs> so it's actually not that hard to be 10 steps above your competition. And an easy way to do that is to, Take some time to truly think about who your customer is and think about them like so intimately to where 
what does this person do when they wake up? Like before their feet even hit the floor, what are they doing? And how can you be inserted seamlessly into that? <laughs> like, you know, does your customer meditate? I don't know. You know, what are they doing in every area of their day? Like take a few hours and just jot down every single detail and then figure out where you can slot your brand in there. Because once you touch every area of their life, like you become their best friend. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like you become a part of them and their routine and they ha- you're essential at this point. And that's how you can connect to them at a deeper level and truly outshine the competition who's just trying to push products. <laughs> and in that you've touched on something interesting, like integration into a customer's life. So yeah. if someone starts out selling in one category, how important is it to diversify into a wider array of products, making more of a lifestyle offering, mm-hmm. whether that's skincare, accessories, and mm-hmm. basics, or some interesting mix? Like, is is yeah. can you stick to just the category of apparel, or do in order to be successful these days and success, successful at merchandising as well as retail, you need to kind of think of it in the wider context, just like mm-hmm. anthropology or free people do? Right. I think. At some point, you're going to want to diversify, you know, um, in some way, shape or form, because the goal is to one, serve your customers and to make money. (laughs) So if we think about uh, increasing the amount of money somebody spends with you every time they shop, if you just have apparel, okay, cool. But like, I'm going to need a necklace. I'm going to need rings. I'm going to need other things. And I would love to buy that from my favorite retailer, but they don't offer that. So you're forcing your customer to go somewhere else or to just shop somewhere else when they're looking for an entire outfit. They're not even considering you. So I do think that you will want to diversify. But at the same time, if you're like, nope, I just want to be apparel. No. Cool. Then you're going to have to add other things, though. You're going to have to add services or events or some other type of way to connect with your customer to keep serving them. Um, Maybe it's a partnership with a brand who does sell accessories, not sure. But yeah, I think you cannot be single-minded. You have to be flexible in retail. <laughs> so by diversifying your your merchandising and in order to be profitable, that does include um, shopping across different categories mm-hmm. if selling product is a key focus, is what yes. you're saying. Exactly. Absolutely. So then... Talk a little bit more to that. So let's say someone is historically known for accessories and maybe like small leather goods. How do they go about kind of expanding, um, figuring out what to offer next? Yes, I think honestly, this is simple, I guess, but know your customer. You have to watch them all the time, right? Like look at TikTok or wherever they are and see what they're doing, what they're wearing, know what other brands that they're shopping and ask them, (laughs) go in your stories. You know, like, I think social media is a good and a bad thing. (laughs) It has its moment. But one good thing that it is, it, it gives you the ability to truly direct, like talk directly to your customer. I can literally go on Instagram right now and post a question for my audience to look at and answer. Do it talk to your customers, you know, host events, host innovative things to get them talking to you. Um, Because if one thing that I've learned from being in this industry, if you ask Mm -hmm. your customers to tell you something, especially the bad things, they will tell Mm -hmm. you, (laughs) they will tell you. So just ask. And there's nothing wrong with experimenting either. You know, try a collaboration maybe with a brand that sells the type of category that you're looking to get into and sell that in your store and see how it does. So how do they, how do they, how would you recommend um, Mm -hmm. merchandising services and events along with physical goods? Mm -hmm. uh, You've mentioned this a couple times. I know. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, in in my dream e-commerce world, uh, there would not be, I mean, it's not a dream actually, it's called headless commerce, headless e-commerce, but there's not this templatey grid system on the website. Yes, it works, but how much 
how many other options have we really tried? You know, like what about interactive ways to, to see and, inter- and engage with your customer on your website without just the blocks? Because then it just looks like we're just selling products again. <laughs> right. So um, like a tool that I love is called Video Ask. It's all over my website. So if you don't know what it is, go look. <laughs> but okay. um, that's a video way to ask your customers questions um, or like your live chat instead of it being a little button, the traditional button that we see where we know it's a chat bot, have it yeah. be a video ask where it's literally the, a person saying, hi, how can I help you? Let me know. And you can respond back to them via video, audio or text. I so, love yeah, that. So it's I'm going to get that. that. Yes. You'll love it. <laughs> I, love that, that, I love that. I mean, because so, yeah. I, and what you're bringing up is like um, providing customer service through yes. mediums that your customers are more comfortable with. So mm-hmm. some are video, some is uh, some are auditory, and then like you said, right. some are very phone based text. Like that's amazing. Yeah. Have you? And what are the results that you've seen from kind of adopting that as an all as a new strategy in customer service? Like, have mm-hmm. retail have some of your clients seen positive results with that? Absolutely. It it really helps with retention. So again, with the marketing conversations, a lot of it is driven on um, getting new customers in. Not enough is talked about really keeping the customers you have (laughs) and growing how much they spend with you. And that's where a lot of this stuff comes in because if I meet, you know, if I come across a new brand, I buy something, it's cool brand. Awesome. But what else is there? Like how else can I engage with this brand? So when you have these services or events and things to really drive that connection home, we see absolutely higher customer retention rates, higher conversion rates, because again, you're connected. So these customers will pay more for whatever goods you have than this other person because they have that connection with you. So that that is a great example, I think, of another thing that you speak a lot about, which is um, increasing your sales without increasing your marketing spend. So do you have a few more examples of some of the innovative ways that you focused on retention to help Mm -hmm. your retailers without the complete outgo of marketing dollars? Yes. So marketing, I like to think of it as, well, it is. It's not just me thinking, <laughs> but it's, it really just amplifies what you already have. Keep so talking. There are, yeah, there are a million things that you can do to your website or your brick and mortar store to optimize it for more sales before you spend a dollar on ads. So invest in looking at your UX on your, your website, the user journey, the user experience. You know, like at the Retail Innovation Conference, I think it was last week, (laughs) there was so much talk about about UX and how, you know, if you're, where should your add to cart button be and just all these little tinkering things, but invest in that because if you're going to spend thousands of dollars in getting people to your site, we want to make sure that they actually convert. So that, you know, adding the live options, like I was mentioning earlier with the chat, um, but actually making the site easy to navigate. <laughs> like, it seems so simple, but just a lot of people don't have a shop all button. And some people hate that. Some people don't. But again, if I'm coming to your site and I'm like, I'm looking, for example, when I shop for photo shoots, I need an address or whatever. I need a ring. I need all these things. So if I'm going to a new brand's website, I want to shop all. Because I'm going to go through your whole entire thing and pick what I want and just add it all to cart. Do not make me go from tops. Then look at that. Now I got to remember what tops I put in my cart. You know what I'm saying? Like, make it when you go through your site and even in your store, like, take your best selling category and then look at how easy it is for somebody to shop that category and to buy other things that align with that category. Um, so that those are some things, but I'm trying to think some other, well, let's think of some brick and mortar examples. Oh, sure. one of my favorite things is like, I love gifts. <laughs> so having a yeah. gift, gift bar in your store year round, yeah. you know, yeah. like make yourself a destination for that. And uh, a store here that I love, one of my girls, clients slash friend, whatever, um, in, in Atlanta is Sustainable Home Goods. It's in Pont City Market, which is the second location in Serenby. But she has a gift 
space in the store. So every time I have a new visitor come to my house, I go to her store and I curate their own little welcome gift box for them. Right? It's just like, think of how you can get make yourself a monopoly in your customer's mind. So she has a monopoly in my mind. She's the yeah. only person that I'm going to to get, get these welcome gifts. So yeah, it's just kind of, again, thinking outside of the retail box to yeah. create experiences and products and services that still align with what you're trying to accomplish. And in, in terms of, like, I mean, that's, like you said, that's another a unique way of using merchandising in order to yeah. in, retain customers and keep them coming back. Mm -hmm. So let's take that example and get a little bit more tactical. What mm -hmm. are the average retail price points of the gifts that you buy for people that you curate into these little customized packages? Mm -hmm. What she actually did, which I believe she changed recently. Um, I haven't been there in about a month. But it was just $60 and they have one size box and she had little uh, travel size items or smaller size items. So she did have to do a lot of work <laughs> to figure out which items fit within the margin that she wanted to hit. Got it. Got they it. set that $60 box. You go in, you pick three items, put it in the box. It already has the uh, filler paper in there. And then you go check out, they close it up, wrap it. And then obviously there's cards right there at the counter. Yep. So you can quickly yep. <laughs> grab that and add that to um, the box. So yeah, so it's $60. It was $60 at retail and she just had to negotiate the cost for those smaller items. Yeah, it was it was a maze <laughs> of sorts, but okay. long term it works. <laughs> yeah. And then you know, you, you mentioned margins. So yes. with inflation and with shipping costs and logistics, like um, I feel that margins have started to be eroded mm -hmm. a bit. So right. what are what are the average margins retailers are seeing now and how are they kind of uh, are there any creative or unique ways that you've seen to improve the eat into a margin on a product? Yes, um, I've seen overall the margin it's changing but i've seen a lot of people doing price increases as well but i think what i'd say to that so it's kind of flat but i'd say do not just increase your entire assortment like 10 percent or 15 percent you should really yeah. look at your entire product assortment and there's mm -hmm. always going to be places that you can squeeze so yeah. you know your best selling items people are going to notice if you change those prices. Yeah. And they'll probably be really pissed at you. But <laughs> there's a lot of other items that aren't best sellers that you could probably increase the price by, you know, 10, 15% or whatever the case is. Yeah. And they won't really notice and nobody will really care. And that right. will at least make up for a good chunk of that margin you might be missing from the best seller product. Okay. So it's really just like know your numbers. Preach that a lot. But know your numbers. <laughs> And it, apply the increases where you can um, so that you don't have to do this whole blanket. We took all of our prices up. You don't even have to do that at that point. Right. And what are you seeing in terms of um, are, are retailers continually in store or online? Is it staple bestsellers or has there been a continual bestseller created by current market trend happening? That's a good question. I think it depends on the retailer because okay. there's, well, I mean, some retailers have a true basics business, you know, so they might have some trendy things, but then they also have the things that sell day in and day out, like stable t-shirts or um, socks, you know, things, things like that. So I really think it, it depends on the retailer, but knowing that, a lot of retailers do have the opportunity to have a basics business that they're not thinking about. Yeah. Um, which will help stabilize <laughs> some of the things yeah. that we're talking about, because yeah. if you're risking your entire assortment, your entire budget on trends yep. versus having maybe 60% trend, 40% basic or whatever the mix is right for you. But you know that that 40% is pretty steady. <laughs> you know, yeah. you don't, you're not impacted as much by when massive trend shifts happen. So really looking at the business and seeing if there's an opportunity for you to do basics, like if you mm -hmm. sell a lot of um, 
transparent or chiffon things, you should mm-hmm. sell tank top. <laughs> right, right, right. All those little <laughs> cute candy things underneath. Oh my gosh. Yes. Make my life right. easier, please. Right. So, um, yeah, but it's really just being in tune with what's going on, like we've talked about, with, with what's trending, but also your own business and finding those hidden opportunities. And have you seen retailers kind of gravitating to more to the online marketplaces with success or um, mm-hmm. or lack thereof? Because I know for retail, you know, sometimes you really want to see it and touch it, feel it. But right. what has right. been the impact of like, you know, the wholesale online orders? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like fair or right. like the private sites through the yeah. the trade shows that they attend, things like that. Mm-hmm. I've seen that people still really value in person, especially mm-hmm. for apparel and things that are so important for you to know the quality of it, the yep. like tangible quality of something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. You cannot replace that at all. But also, and I, I'm working on something for for a client that I'm thinking about. It's for furniture and home, the home industry. And I'm trying to search online. It is not easy. Because you're, it's a lot more wrangling versus showing up at this trade show, going through. I have all the information on this, the app for the trade show, um, you know, or the person right there in my face, and I can get things done and move on. Yep. So I think people do like the convenience of being able to source products mm-hmm. online, yes. But the back end stuff <laughs> of like the chasing and the runaround, um, not being able to touch things makes it a bit more difficult. Um, and especially for brands, the brands who are showing online for the first time have a really difficult time. Okay. A really difficult time. Mm-hmm. So as we move into the rest of 2022 and 2023, what are some of the strategies that you're advising clients to kind of start considering? Yes, definitely. Obviously, I'm going to keep saying services and, <laughs> and events <laughs> until people, everybody listens. Go into that. Talk about like how a retailer can start to offer services. If so, what type? Or yeah. if they're going to do an event in their store, what yeah. does that look like? So, so throw it yeah. down and throw it out. Right. Well, I'd say something that I think we're going to see emerging, it is emerging, is truly community-driven events. Mm -hmm. Um, An example that I learned about at the Retail Innovation Conference was Foot Locker. They actually have community stores, is what they call it, and they have community events (laughs) within the store environment. And the one that they were talking about was, uh, I think they had 20 local artists come into the store, and it was a collaboration with New Balance. Mm -hmm. And um, I forget what they exactly did. I think they designed the sneakers, actually. They're artists. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sneakers, but it was connecting them to the community. That's a big one. I think retailers definitely have the opportunity to reach out into the community that they're a part of and find new ways to collaborate. So whether it's, I don't know, Mimosa Mondays <laughs> and, and, you know, things Love like it. that, or yeah. think about how you can give back to your community. This is another yeah. big one. Um, you know, are there, if you are a women's store, how can you connect with uh, women in your community who need help or who need support yeah. through your store? You yeah. know, like there's just so many things that you can do in other small businesses within your community who need exposure. Let them do pop ups in your store. That's another revenue yeah. generating love thing for that. You too. Yeah. Yeah. I love so, that. Yeah. So again, just removing that. I, I'm here. I sell products. No, you have a mm-hmm. space where you happen to sell products, but the ultimate goal is to serve this problem for your customer. So what other people around you are serving these same problems that you can connect with? That's right. That's kind of how. And, and it sounds like there should be a level of more specificity in the problems yes. they solve for, yes. with, for whoever the audience is. So right. you could um, specialize mm-hmm. in an natural skincare and organic products designed for women of color. Or right. more specifically, yes. black women that yes. isn't based on like ma- more mainstream market things because there right. is differences. OK, yes. or yes. I'm just throwing some examples out there to kind of get mm-hmm. people thinking. Right. Or right. You, know, you could do something really cool with like you're saying 
men's grooming products for men that might be in larger bodies. Like you can look yes. hip and hot and still be a little honky, you know? Like, right, 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 right. Is, is that kind of where you're going with it is just to like, yes. okay. Yes. That's it's awesome. a really niching down. <laughs> what yes, people, yeah, people yeah, like yeah. To call it. <laughs> but, right. but it's true. Everybody cannot serve everybody. And then if you are trying to serve everybody, then you are competing with everybody. Everybody. <laughs> Yep. Yep. So the further you niche down, um, a good good way to look at it, too, is uh, Regina, I cannot pronounce her last name, but she's a coach in the service business world. Mm-hmm. She calls it like carving your monopoly. So okay. it's like, who do you serve? And then how can you add an element to that that nobody else is doing? Yeah. Um, like an example, I guess, is me. So <laughs> I'm a retail mm-hmm. consultant. And then, yes. you know, how I serve people is different than a lot. I think I don't really know maybe one other consultant doing this, but I do VIP days. So we work together in one day. We hash out your strategy, like what's working, what's not working. Where do we want to see your business going? What are those new things we can infuse into your business to help you grow? And we do it in a day because you guys are busy and I hear it all the time. (laughs) Like you're under staff, you know, busy. So, okay, take a day, be a CEO for a day with me. So it's like, what can you do? How do you deliver your products? Maybe that's some way that you can have a monopoly. Um, there's a, a well, company and, here. And let's let's talk yeah. about real quick. Sorry to interrupt you, but no, no, go ahead. we both love VIP days. So why don't you tell people a little bit about the concept, <laughs> of who, yeah. where you learned it, and maybe is there a way for a retailer to even design a VIP day for their clientele? Ooh, I like that. What? Right? So, yeah. So, so Tara, tell me. Let's talk about <laughs> VIP days because you and I love them. We do. We do. Yeah. Uh, VIP day. A VIP day is a three to eight hour day <laughs> where you solve a specific problem for your client. And I learned about it from, we learned about it from Jordan Gill with System yeah. Save Me. She has a whole program about it. But yeah, how could retailers do it? Well, one thing I'll say is that it's not just the day. We should say that, right? right? <laughs> the disclaimer right. is for you, it's just that day that we meet. But for us, it's research. Like as soon as you, you book, there's a questionnaire and then we're doing research and we're actually doing a lot of work <laughs> to prepare for that day so that we can yeah. get a lot done in that day. Yeah. Um, and then there's sometimes deliverables after. Yeah. But how a retailer could do a VIP day. That's a good one. I mean, like styling a good. home in a day, so helping yes, them stay in the room. Exactly. Oh or like, God, that's a good I've one. been looking forever for like someone that offers like a fashion styling VIP days for yes. curvy girls, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I just, I just was starting to think like, as we've been talking, like yes. maybe like that's enough and that's a service thing. And it you is. just happen to have the products that tie into exactly. the, the problem that you're solving. Yes. That's so true. Oh, and there and- are people that are readily willing to yes. pay you to like help them style their rooms, mm-hmm. help them dress mm-hmm. in a day, and they you know versus you know them having yes. to go to fifteen different stores over a couple right. days in order to achieve mm-hmm. one thing. Because that like said, right. shopping can be overwhelming for some people. For sure, that's true. And yeah. um, you made me think of like a kid store. Get your entire, Ooh. you know, back to school wardrobe or shopping done in a day. If you yeah. sell like office supplies or clothes for mm-hmm. kids, that's interesting. See, yeah, when you just right. start talking and that's, that's what right. I want. I know, to I know. Like, we've like, gone from B to B to over to B to C to <laughs> back again. But but I think that that I is, know. that's why we decided to have this conversation is just to help retailers kind of reframe the way they look at what they're selling yes. as not being so purely transactional right. as it could be more experiential or service mm-hmm. based to yes. provide an outcome. And then the win-win yes. is you've got a customer that you've helped and they're mm-hmm. going to keep coming back to you no matter what, because you help them achieve something or solve a challenge that they had. Right. And, and when you're saying that too, it makes me mm-hmm. think because I feel like a lot of retailers are stuck in a rut because it's been rough, you know. Yeah, it retail has been in general, <laughs> but retail is a hard business. But it's been yeah. rough these last couple of years, and I do feel like there's a lot of retailers who are asking themselves, "Is yeah. this really what I want to be doing?" Or something's missing. I need right. something else. 
And it's, right. I truly feel that it's, it's because they're missing that, that deep connection to yep. that customer or having a problem to solve, you know, yep. and you can change that around. We yeah. just talked about many ways to do that. Find a local community organization you can partner with or yeah. change up your mission. <laughs> Have yeah. a mission. <laughs> right. You know, like right. something, but find another thing. I keep talking about the innovation conference. There was a lot of like good nuggets, but yeah. one of the guys who owns, I forget the name of his company, but um, he, he has a blankets company. So every time you buy a blanket, he gifts one to the homeless. Yes. Yes. So what he said, I think it was something rags. Oh my gosh, my memory, guys. But <laughs> but what he said was find something that you love mm-hmm. and then find an injustice you absolutely hate. And marry those two things together and you found like something that won't feel like work. And I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, that is it. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully that helps. But yeah, it's just all about you got to know who you are and what you want, and that changes. Yeah, you know, so um, it's so easy to change what looks like a retail business from the outside to be more of a service business. Yeah, I think a lot of us we're in the service business, so it's just like look at your model and throw retail out the window and rethink what you're doing and see how you can do it in a fresh new way. I love it. So Deanna, where can everyone find you? Yeah. So DeannaMcIntosh.com or RetailingEvolved.com, but on all social platforms at Deanna J. McIntosh. Awesome. And then I will link to those in the show notes and everything else for you guys. And I will also link to her VIP day because I think many of uh, you in the retail community could benefit from just doing that um, Mm -hmm. offering she has. And it's at a fantastic price point, too. But, Mm -hmm. you know, I've talked to Deanna for a couple hours in the last few weeks and she she's blown my mind. And I can only imagine what she could do in a day. Yes. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening. To learn more, visit ASD Market Week at asdonline.com. To listen to more great episodes, be sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, or Spotify, and make sure to rate us too.